<laughs> right. Uh, she's a professor and is chair of applied mathematics at the Department of um, or in the Mathematics Department at the University of California, which said. Uh, she also serves as the faculty co advisor of cyber infrastructure and research technologies and is the co director of the Cal Grid program in mathematics. Uh, her research aims to use analysis and computation of mathematical models to gain insight into biological systems such as protein aggregation diseases and blood coagulation. As a department chair, she works to increase the accessibility of the entry level mathematics curriculum as well as develop new undergrad programs in data science and innovative interdisciplinary graduate programs in computational biology. Since 2019, she has partnered with the lab on the Data Science Challenge, a summer hackathon style program where teams of useful research students work on real data science problems with lab scientists. Suzanne grew up in Placentia, California as the proud daughter of immigrants from Saudi Arabia and Portugal. She holds a PhD from the University of Maryland in College Park and was a postdoc scholar at Brown University prior to joining UC Merced in 2012. Outside of work, she enjoys science fiction, musical theater, movies of all kinds, and true crime podcasts. So without further ado. Thanks. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, so Buddy is doing work. I feel slightly awkward about it when I'm saying because I want to get back and I want to do some work, so I'm gonna try to be to, to keep things brief, I was honored to be invited to come and speak here. As um, you heard in my bio, I do data science um, in my own research and interests. I also think it's a really, really great way to get students um, involved and interested in just thinking about science in general, math, computer science. I think it's a great um, entryway. And, um, I also think it's important, so you guys just heard um, a bit of a bio. I think it's really important to think about um, how we get here, to where we're where. And I think it's where I am, and I won't just say middle age as someone who has a job, because I, I remember being a student, and I know there's a lot of students online. Um, it, it's kind of hard to see yourself being in a, in a professional role. And um, I want to talk a little bit about my journey, um, just at an end life. So here is a picture that actually one of my grad students found uh, somewhere online. This is me at an RU in uh, 2000. So RU stands for uh, Research Experience for Undergraduates. And so the NSF has been all over the country, and I went to an RU at Cornell, um, and that was me. My hair was a little puffier uh, than now. So. I wanted to talk a little bit about what I do. Um, this, uh, I've been introduced, and there's a lot of people here. I look forward to talking a lot of you. So this is going to be a few real high-level things. Um, but I want to emphasize ways that um, statistics, machine learning, and data science are involved in, in my own work. So I have a really cool project um, that, broadly speaking, as someone in the NIH and the American Association of Immunologists, where we uh, look at um, single cell RNA sequencing data. So those of you that never really think about biology, um, we now have the ability to measure essentially gene expression in, in individual cells. And you've got a lot of cells, um, they have a lot of genes, there's a lot of noise. And if you're trying to do things like find subpopulations of cells that are responsible for interesting things, looking at development, now these are all questions that um, Machine learning, deep learning um, can help can help realize. And um, this is again work that um, I've done with some great folks at the University of California, where I am. Um, there's another project that um, I find and I have highlighted here. This is a former PhD student of mine who is now a professor um, at Coe College. So it's kind of neat to see your students grow up and get to work with them in different ways. And so what we have done here. It is basically used a, a complex model of blood coagulation to, to start run synthetic clinical trials is how we, we think about it. So if you um, say we know that there are certain drugs that some patients um, might have challenges with, right? So you're trying to predict um, how to give uh, the right drugs the right person or, or even just understand why there's some rare effects. Well, one of the things that we can do, uh, this was a, a, a picture from my paper where we essentially randomly generated individuals um, that were thought to come from normal factor levels. We ran hundreds of thousands of them through and looked for cases that you had particularly high responses in, um, in thrombin. So thrombin is one of the um, 
uh, for who's responsible for um, blood clotting. And then since we knew what every single patient was, we could back out of that, what their specific factor combinations were. This suggested some interesting biochemical things that individuals can go um, and then test experimentally. So this is a case where you can use a complex model and statistics to sort of motivate, um, again, doing actual clinical trials is obviously better than doing it on a computer, but uh, using a computational model can really accelerate um, these, uh, these processes. So uh, the third area that, that I work in is as um, was talked about in protein aggregation and disease. So I'll say just, just a little bit more about this. Um, so we know that um, protein misfolding and aggregation is part of um, lots of really terrible things, frankly, that happen um, in, in mammals. So Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington. Uh, these pictures here, strictly mad cow and Kukkot Yakub, are a particularly rare class of, of protein misfolding diseases. Um, but what is interesting is the same process, so protein misfolding and aggregation, can actually be used um, to create beneficial traits in some cases. And so, uh, you know, uh, one that I think is neat is they're apparently it's responsible for, for short term memory, so they can disrupt. Um, I guess these aggregation pathways in slugs and in flies, and then suddenly those animals aren't as good at doing mazes or, you know, the New York Times crossword puzzle, right? And it's not, it's, it's still not clear why exactly. Um, so I work with a yeast biologist and we try to understand these processes within yeast. And again, to me, this is a nice um, a view of how mathematics computation modeling and now data can was um, in the discovery process, right? So you have some kind of theory, you build some kind of computational model, maybe that model inspires some experiments, that experiments give you data, that data needs analyzing, and you uh, keep keep doing things. So this is, I guess, what keeps me, um, I don't know, keeps me up at night, will keep me entertained and motivated for many, many more years of, of work. Um, so there is an interesting, um, uh, I, I think characterization to a lot of the work I've, I've done, so I'll just say, again, this is just a tiny overview. In, in yeast, um, you have this multi-scale aggregation process. You have, at a molecular scale, you have proteins that are being made. Um, yeast cells divide, these misfolded proteins transmit. Cells have interesting um, timing of cell cycles, lineages, and then they ultimately grow out into a colony. And so collectively, um, my work is hopefully going to give insight into how level spatial organizations emerge in these different processes. So this is um, a lot of what I, I want to do. Um, and we've built some, um, some mathematical models that look at um, basically the bio, biophysics of how these cells interact, grow, and push around each other. We put um, intracellular dynamics inside of them, and then you get like cool little colonies um, of dividing cells. And we are trying to compare these two experiments. So we have some deep learning image analysis on experiments that we're going to try to compare to these simulations. So again, never bored. Um, and I, I want to point out, this is usually at the end of my talk, my, uh, my acknowledgement slide. That's something else that I want everyone, all the particularly students here to think about is most people don't work by themselves. And so there's a long list of people here, and there's even more. Um, and so I think a lot of the really best scientific work you do is you are never going to be an expert in everything. You find really cool people that you love talking with all the time, and it helps um, help you do incredible things. Um, since this is not women in work, this is women in data science adjacent, I do want to point out that I'm really uh, proud to be uh, the chair of a mathematics department that has 50%, uh, slightly more than 50% of women faculty and we're right now. So um, uh, more faculty, so it's it's very exciting. Um, and then now that I've given a uh, really quick overview of everything that I do, um, I thought it would be a little bit uh, appropriate to talk a little bit about this story of how you get to where you are. So it came up um, in the introduction that um, I'm the proud daughter of immigrants, and both of my parents, um, we use the word like first generation college student a lot. My parents were, uh, were more than first generation college students. They were first generation high school students. I think my grandparents on both sides uh, never really completed a formal education. And so my parents, um, this is a picture of them in Paris, 
uh, sometime in 1965, my mom is guessing. It. Um, and uh, both of them came uh, to the United States. My mom came from Forge in the, in the Azores. So this is part of Portugal. There's a lot of Azorean immigrants in um, California. She came here in 1617, didn't speak any English uh, to you know, help her parents out with all kinds of stuff. Uh, my father is from Saudi Arabia. He came as a college student. And again, you know, this was a time that you couldn't call your family, right? Like you would talk about, you had to schedule a call. So to me, that's like pretty brave. Um, they came here and they uh, lived in Wilsonshire, California. So if you're familiar with Orange County, this is a pretty accurate picture. Um, and so from the beginning, I knew, and I, I'm sensing a lot of you probably have this too, my parents talked to me about how important education was and how it was really, it's a privilege and an honor and, a, and also a responsibility um, to help others seek that out. So it's, it's pretty important to me. Um, I uh, This also came up in the, in the intro, but I think it's pretty important. So I was, uh, I did not have, I had a really amazing high school uh, calculus teacher who was, uh, who was a woman. She came to my wedding. She was really important in my life. And I went off to have absolutely no women math professors at all in undergrad and grad. And when I was a postdoc, there were no even tenure track women in the department, let alone tenure. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I would say, you know, maybe for some people, they would go into math or, or STEM and there would be some, you know, they'd see somebody that was, was like them. So I would say for me, a lot of my big influences actually always came from outside of um, outside the world. And then you mentioned like science fiction and things and I'm, I'm really serious. Like I, I watch an insane amount of movies and TV and I it just, I, I always feel like, you know, sometimes you meet people, apologies if you're these people. Where you're like, oh my god, I don't know how people watch television. It's like so many people. I watched so much TV, and <laughs> and um, it's it's fun. I don't know. You need something to to unwind and just to stress that this is not something I'm seeing in a joke. This picture this morning, I took this in my house. Like this is like how. I don't know. <laughs> so I think it's really important that you can I don't know. You can be silly. You can be weird, and you can do whatever whatever you want. There is no one way to be to be a scientist, to be a professor, to be an interesting. Um, you heard a little bit of an overview, so I'll go through this um, a little bit quickly. I did my undergraduate uh, degree at Cal State Fullerton, which is in Fullerton, which is adjacent to Placentia, where I grew up. So by the time I finished my undergrad, I was ready to go as far away as possible from Southern California. So I went to the University of Maryland, um, and then I, that's where I met my, uh, my cousin, who's now my husband. I did a postdoc at Brown University, and I was really thrilled to get to come back to California and has been at uh, UC Merced since 2012. It was very briefly mentioned um, in the intro that I'm the co-director of CalBridge Math, so I just want to say CalBridge is a program that is trying to get um, encourage more students from Cal States to pursue um, PhDs. And again, wouldn't it be great if they did a PhD at the University of California campus? So this is something um, that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about because it was a path um, that I took. Um, and then, even though you know your sort of whole career, you write papers, you do things, you um, have grants. I want to point out that the thing that I'm the absolute proudest about is actually the students I've mentored. So these are some of my former um, former PhD students and master's students. Um, this is not the complete list, but I do want to point out in the upper right corner. This is Elizabeth Owens, and she is a faculty member at Las Positas College, which I know is not too far from here. She came through the California Community College system and was really passionate about going back to that. Um, and then this is Michael Staub, who I briefly mentioned that I uh, continue to do research with. And this is Mario Vanuelos at Fresno State, who um, is um, you know, now I get to interact with and Eric Roberts, who now works at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So, um, and if there are random things that I would shout at everyone, um, I would say, well, we'll just be excellent to each other. I feel like Sometimes maybe I feel like the next generation is a little less so, but I remember I was in school with people that like to talk about how smart they were and how much better at coding they were than everybody else. And just like, I don't know, try not to do that, try to be cool. Um, chances are you guys are, uh, even adults know it's all right. So adults just calm down, but like younger people, you're always smarter than you think you are. Um, and then don't change who you are. Be weird, be whatever you want. Go, go on and then find awesome people to be with. And actually, I guess I, I should say, adults need to be reminded of this. So, find awesome people and do oh, those things. Do that again. I think that's it. Okay, I think that's it. And I'm going to 
we will get our questions. Yes. That will be back in data. <laughs> I guess I have a question. Yeah, I know you, you've had a lot of students from ECMS that have recently come to yes. work at the lab. Yeah. Do you have anything that you want to say and speak on? Or uh, some of the students said, uh, what, what they did? Oh, well, uh, so um, well, we got a couple of UC Merced students sort of here, here in the room. Um, yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about You were part of the data science challenge. What was, what was that like? Uh, so uh, last summer there was a two-week data science challenge on campus at UC Merced, and I think each year has a different theme. Um, last year it was um, it was a project related to COVID, COVID protein research here at North Livermore. Um, so I think Yo Jin Kim and his team were trying to identify these compounds that inhibit a particular COVID protein. I can't remember which protein it was. Was it a spike protein or? I believe it was. Yeah, it was, so he had a lot of a huge amount of data of um, potential leads that you know you know bound to a COVID protein successfully or not successfully, and so we went through this large amount of data and tested various machine learning uh, models on them to see if we could infer associations between chemical features from RD kit and successful inhibition of COVID proteins, and it was really a fascinating. So that was one component. Another component was like voxelization of 3D data, of like the electrostatic surface of proteins and how it binds to inhibitors. It was really fascinating. It was a great project. It was really dense. It was a crash course in using scikit-learn and Python. So it was a wonderful opportunity, and I would recommend it to any 